What is the image of the beast? That is the question we will be tackling today. And with this video, I hope you see the real truth behind what has been hidden from you, as well as hidden history from you so that you can see the truth and be deceived no more because I'm letting you know there is a bigger deception coming. But we've all heard of the phrase image of the beast and mark of the beast. But what is the real image of the beast that scripture is talking about? And how can we identify the image of the beast using scripture itself to help us? That and more to come as we tackle this question and go along this journey into finding truth because the truth will be revealed today. In order for us to properly identify the image of the beast, we must first seek scripture and see what scripture says about the image of the beast and let scripture speak for itself. And so here I am in Hazun or Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to be going over this chapter with you in detail and I'm going to show you then what the real image of the beast really is and just who the beasts really are. So we're here in Revelation chapter 13 and it says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns okay and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy and the beast which i saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority and i saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast and i'm going to go over with you in just a second what that deadly wound actually is and they worshiped the beast which gave power unto or they worshiped the dragon i should say which gave power unto the beast and they worshiped the beast saying who is like unto this beast who is able to make more war with him and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months and because this is a truth network, I use the set apart restored Hebrew names for our creator Yahuwah and his true son Yahusha. So it says in verses six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against what you may call in the Hebrew Elohim. Another way to pronounce that is Allahim to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in Shamayim or heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the Kadashim or saints and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world that's talking about the real messiah yahusha if any man have an ear let him hear he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity he that killeth with the sword shall be killed by the sword here is the patience and the belief of the kadashim and i beheld another beast coming out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon so let's first go over the first 10 verses and what you start to see is who is this first beast well first of all we can all agree that the first beast is talking about what papal rome and the roman catholic church all roads lead to rome and we can agree and we know that scripture is talking about that is because when it says that he speaks great things and blasphemies, that this beast will speak great blasphemies, when it says 42 months, we have to take the day and a year prophecy that is spoken of in the book of Bamidbar or Numbers. And when you do this, you get 1,260 years is what that means. So it's not a literal 42 months or three and a half years as the Christian church falsely teaches. No, it is actually 1,260 years that that's talking about and what one entity just so happens to fit that prophecy quite well is the roman catholic church is because the roman catholic church came into power in 538 a.d really into power and it ended in 1798 a.d with the with the exile of one of the popes by napoleon himself and when it says that the deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast what is the deadly wound talking about 
about? The deadly wound is talking about the establishment of the Vatican in 1929 on February 11th, 1929 to be exact. That is talking about the deadly wound. And I'm going to show you an article later on to even prove that. But let's keep going. We're going to verse 11 and now we're going to the second beast that comes up. It says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast or papal rome or the roman catholic church whose deadly wound was healed and we know the deadly wound is the vatican which i'm about to show you in just a second and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven or shamaim on the arats or earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles that which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all both great and small, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, if you saw my uh, 666 video and is 666 the mark of the beast, you would have seen that scripture and that this was originally written in Greek. So it would be a Greek symbol in verse 18. And I proved that 666 is not the mark of the beast, but rather the mark of the beast has to do with worship. It has to do with religion itself. And you can watch my video on that for more. And Yahuwah willing, next week I'm going to be doing part two to the mark of the beast so you can see exactly what it really truly is. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is not 666. It is a Greek symbol. And when it says number, that is mistranslating. It should say symbol or mark is what that should say. So we know that the beast and the image of the beast has to do something with the Roman Catholic Church. We know it has to do with the Vatican, and we know it has to do with Papal Rome. And as I proved in my uh, Mark of the Beast video in the part one, I even told you and showed you of hidden history in the Inquisition that took place between the years 538 AD and 1798 AD, and how the Roman Catholic Church is responsible for the deaths of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people during this times with their heresies and all of their other heretical nonsense that they put in and enforce in order for the world to worship the beast. And if people did not worship or if they did not follow the beast, then they were seen as what? They were seen as peasants and heresies and they had to be killed. And just look at the Puritans for more and the whole Salem witch trials and that will tell you exactly what I'm talking about and you're going to see that and you're even going to see that they even played a role with slavery too so that should be a big hint but let's keep going as I have said before and as I have said earlier the deadly wound that was healed was in fact the establishment of the Vatican or should I say the re-establishment of the Vatican known as Vatican City which was on February 11th 1929 so that prophecy has already been fulfilled now mainstream Christian churches want you to believe that oh it has to do with the future prophecy and oh it has to do with some antichrist coming onto the scene in the middle of a three and a half year period and Daniel's 70th week. No, that is all pure blasphemy when all of these prophecies have been fulfilled. And so we're going to see exactly how, if okay, if we know that the beast has to do with papal Rome and we know that the beast has to do with Rome itself and the Catholic Church, or should I say the Roman Catholic Church, because all roads lead to Rome, then we know that the image of the beast has something to do with what the Catholic Church and what the Roman Catholic Church is pushing. It has to, according to scripture. It cannot do with anything else. It has to do with something that's tied with the Roman Catholic Church. And you're gonna even see just what I'm talking about.
Now I'm here at the Britannica Encyclopedia and like I said, the image of the beast has to do something with a pope or has to do with the Roman Catholic Church since we have just identified that the Roman Catholic Church is the first beast that is identified in Revelation chapter 13 and later on I'm going to tell you what the second beast is. But here I am at the Britannica website and it talks about Pope Alexander the Sixth, and you're going to see why he's so important and what this has to do with the image image of the beast and the purporting of the image of the beast. Now it says Alexander the Sixth, or the original Spanish name in full, Rodrigo de Borgia de Domes, Italian Rodrigo Borgia, born 1431 uh, near Valencia and died on August 18, 1503 in Rome, a corrupt, worldly, and ambitious pope whose neglect of the spiritual inheritance of the church contributed to the development of Protestant Reformation. He was born into the Spanish branch of the prominent and powerful Borgia family. So, okay, so we see that. We see his family and his background. You can read more about his family here. I'll leave the link below. But what I also want to talk about here is during the shadow of simony that surrounded the disposal of his benef benefices among the papal electors, Rodrigo emerged from a tumultuous conclave on the night of August 10th through the 11th, 1492, as Pope Alexander VI and received the acclaim of the Roman populace. He embarked upon a reform of papal finances in a vigorous pursuit of the war against the Ottoman Turks. Remember that the beast would make war against the real true Kadashim and that they would make war and cause the, uh, any of them who did not worship or bow down to the Pope's orders to be killed, which is what happened through the Inquisition, especially during this time. But let's keep going. His position was menaced by the French King Charles VIII, who invaded Italy in 1494 to vindicate his claim to the Kingdom of Naples. Charles, at the instant of a rival cardinal on the influential Della Revere family threatened the Pope with de deposition and the convocation of a reform council. Politically isolated, Alexander sought assistance from the Turkish sovereign Bayezid II. In the course of the Pope's meeting with King Charles in Rome in early 1495, however, he received the traditional obeisance from the French monarch. He still refused to support the king's claim to Naples and, by an alliance with Milan, Venice, and the Holy Roman Emperor, eventually forced the French to withdraw from Italy. But why is he so important? Is because of what? Not, not him per se, but his sons. Let's keep going. In September 1493, Alexander created his teenage son Cesare, a cardinal, along with Alessandro Farnese, the brother of the papal favorite uh, Giulia La Bella, and the future Pope Paul the third. In the course of his pontificate, Alexander appointed 47 cardinals to further his complicated dynastic, ecclesiastical, and political policies. His son Juan was made Duke of Gandia or Spain and was married to Maria Enriquez, the cousin of King Ferdinand IV of Castile. Jaffre was married to Sancia, the granddaughter of the King of Naples, and Lucrezia was given first to Giovanni Zorza of Milan, and when that marriage was annulled by papal decree on the grounds of impotence. She was married to Alfonso of Aragon. Upon his assassination, Lucrezia received as a third husband of Alfonso el Diestra, Duke of Ferrara. And I do apologize if I'm butchering all this. The pronunciation is not what's important. What's important is that you're getting this information and actually taking it in and seeing the truth for what it really is. Then the article goes on to talk about how one of his sons was murdered uh, tragically on June 14th, 1497. And then just after that, just so happens that Cesare Borgia, one of his son, reigned in 1498 and married one of the women there as well and made an alliance with the French king, Louis the the Twelfth. So very interesting. Then it goes on to talk about the rest of his life. Then it also talks about whitewashing as well. And this is according to Britannica itself. But now I would like to turn your attention to Cesare Borgia, the Duke of Valentinois, and what you're going to see is that he was the son of Pope Alexander VI. And even when you look at the Britannica article that talks about Pope Alexander VI, it talks about establishing a new world. Does that sound familiar? Wow, 600, 500 years and nothing has changed. But it goes on to say that what? Cesare Borgia, natural son of Pope Alexander VI. He was a Renaissance captain who, as holder of the offices of 
Duke of the Romagna Church and Captain General of the Armies of the Church, enhanced the political power of his father's papacy and tried to establish his own principality in central Italy. His policies led this person to cite him as an example of the new prince. And it goes on to talk about the son's most famous mistress and also throughout his entire life and who his tutors were and how he rose into power. Because he rose into power just after the death of his brother Juan. Is that a coincidence? It's not looking like it. But when you do more research on this man, Cesare Borgia, you start to find some very interesting things that have been hidden from you on purpose throughout history. Like one of the things that has been hidden from you is that he was a known rapist. This is a fact. And he was also a murderer. He killed his sister's husband. And it's no surprise if he probably killed his brother as well and other abominable things that this man has done under the papacy as well as all of the wars initiated by them as well as the killing and slaughtering of the real true kadashim or saints who are following the law statutes and commandments of our father that is what this man is responsible for but i bet you also didn't know that this man did in fact have a gay lover and you're about to see who that gay lover really was now I'm here at all places and as you can see, what is it called? New World Encyclopedia. But I'm here and it says Cesare Borgia and this is an actual picture of Cesare Borgia and how the man looked. Oh, he looked real similar to somebody else. But let's keep going. This article talks about him more in detail. But what I want to turn your attention to is his later life and later years and what he did. And now it says, a man of scientific rather than artistic interest, Cesare Borgia briefly employed Leonardo da Vinci as military architect and engineer. Now that is a historic fact. Cesare Borgia actually did have ties with Leonardo da Vinci. That is true. Not only that, but it also goes on to say a little known fact about Cesare Borgia is that, according to the French writer Alexandre Dumas and others, and truth itself, his handsome appearance seemed to have influenced many images of what you may call Jesus Christ or JC painted during and subsequent to his career. Is it a coincidence or is it does it strike you odd and suspicious that he would hire and employ Leonardo da Vinci, the same man who painted the Last Supper and many other religious icons and religious pictures during this time. Is that a coincidence at all? Not only that, but you can even see his appearance right here. Who does he look close to? Who does he closely resemble? Who does he closely match? Because here is an image of Cesare Borgia himself and look at what he's holding up. That's a Masonic hand gesture, by the way. But this is his picture, Cesare Borgia, which oddly just so happens to resemble that of the what the world knows as Jesus Christ, the false image. And I can prove it with scripture that this is a false image of the Messiah and that the Messiah does not look like this. But what happened was that in history that what? Cesare Borgia, the son of a pope, the son from a pope who came from papal Rome, which is the beast that we identified in Revelation chapter 13. What did he do? That What did this man do? He hired Leonardo da Vinci to paint pictures of himself. And then what Pope Alexander VI did is that he used the picture and the image of his son, Cesare Borgia, to become known as the image of what? Jesus Christ, the image of the false Messiah. That is what happened. That is hidden history from you. And not only that, but Leonardo da Vinci, not only did he paint other abominable paintings and other abominations that are those religious icons of the Last Supper as well as whitewashing them and painting JC to look like his lover Cesare Borgia because remember they were gay lovers that is the hidden history that they did that is what Cesare Borgia and Leonardo da Vinci did and I'm even going to prove to you in scripture itself in Revelation itself that the Messiah does not look like this he looks nothing like this I'm going to prove that to you in just a second so that you can see the scripture itself agree with what I'm saying. So if we know that the Messiah doesn't look like this, where does this come from? 
Do not be fooled. Do not be deceived. Be deceived no more because I'm here in Revelation or Hazum chapter one. We're back in Revelation and we're going to be reading verses 13 through 15 to see what scripture describes our Messiah looking like. And it says, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks or menorah, one like unto the son of man, clothed with the garment down to the foot and gird about the paps with the golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like white white wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. The question is, does that white image of what you call JC, does that, this, does that fit this description? Does that fit the description of having white hair like wool and white like snow? The answer to that question is no. Remember, always ask questions. That is what you should be doing. Ask questions. And the question we should be asking ourselves is, does this image right here, does this image fit the image that it talks about in Revelation chapter 1 verses 13 through 15. Do you see any white woolly hair right here? I do not see it. So therefore, somebody is lying to you. Do you see white woolly hair? I don't. Also, it says that he has dark skin or feet of fine brass as if burned in a fire. If that's the case, then he's really dark skin or black. Do you see any dark skin right here? This image does not fit scripture. It does not fit Revelation chapter 1 verses 13 through 15. And for those of you who still want to defend this, well, then you need to seriously read scripture and open your eyes and see the truth for yourself and do not be deceived. Ask questions so that you will not be deceived for the bigger deceptions to come, which I'm going to explain to you in just a second. But this image does not fit scripture. Therefore, somebody is lying to you. Now, this is a more accurate picture of how the Messiah looks as described in Revelation chapter 1 verses 13 through 15 as described in scripture itself. As you can see from the picture right here that what white woolly hair, as you can see, as well as dark skin, that is how, that is what scripture says. That is according to scripture itself. So you can't sit here and try to argue me down when I just prove to you what scripture says and how scripture says our Messiah really truly looks according to the scriptures itself. Not only that, but you can think of it as more closely resembling Morgan Freeman. That's how the Messiah more, most closely resembles, more so than that white image spread all over the place. So the question is, where is that white image coming from? And trust me, it's not just that white image either. You're going to see other images of the beast that are what it has to do with religion itself. And I'm going to prove that in just a second. Remember, ask questions. Questions. Remember, always be asking yourself things that seemed or that do contradict scripture. And what you're going to see is that this image is not the only image of the beast. It's also Buddha and Krishna and all the other pagan deities as well. By the way, all of which break commandments because as you see, worshiping this is what? Breaking the first commandment, which is what? Not to have any other idols before our creator, before our father, Yahuwah. And that includes Jason that includes Buddha, that includes Krishna, that includes all of them. And also the second commandment, which is no graven images, the commandment that the Roman Catholic Church took out of their Catholic book. That commandment, you will not find it in a Catholic Bible. Why? Because they took it out and added another commandment on top of that one, breaking even more commandments, which is what? Not to take, add, or take away from the scriptures itself. But that is what they did in order to fool you into believing that first of all, this is how the Messiah looks, even though I've just proven with scripture itself that the Messiah looks nothing like this and looks nowhere near this. And that second of all, that this is all abominable. It's what the real image of the beast revealed today, truth revealed today, but it goes much deeper than that. Hopefully this is making you wonder and hopefully this is helping you open up your mind to a new perspective and ho hopefully this is helping you ask questions because that is the central thing you need to be doing. Asking questions. Why? Why all of this stuff? Why has this history been hidden from you? And why does scripture say the Messiah looked like one thing with dark skin and wooly hair, but this image looks nothing like that? Another question you should be thinking about and when you look at these religious symbols and religious icons, 
all of which are abominable, by the way. But when you look at them, why is there always a Halo Sun figure on them? And why is he always holding up this abominable hand gesture? What does this hand gesture mean? And why do you see it all over the place in almost every image of JC? Why is that the case? And what you're going to see is that you don't, not only do you see it in uh, images of JC, but you also see it with other deities such as uh, Buddha and Krishna as well. Why are they all holding up this Masonic hand gesture? What is it really telling us and showing us? And I'm back here showing you these pictures. And the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to ask why is that hand gesture always seen no matter what image or, or pagan abominable image that is seen of the false messiah? Why is he always holding up this hand gesture, that hand gesture with the two fingers pointed up and the other fingers pointed down? You see it here. You see it there. Why is that always the case? Why is he always holding it up in all the ancient pictures that you see? you always see this hand gesture right here. Why is that the case? Now remember, we should always be asking questions. Now, even if you look at ancient depictions of the Messiah, you see that he is always holding up that same symbol. Why is that the case? And even ones, this was before they were all painted over and whitewashed. And you can watch my video, Who Are the Real Biblical Israelites for more. But you even see it in other ancient paintings that they still hold up this hand gesture. I wonder why that is. And like I said, you see that same Freemasonic hand gesture all over the place depicted on ancient pictures of the Messiah. Not only that, but you see that same halo depicted all over the place. Why is that the case? Could that be denoting sun worship on Sunday? Oh, it's making sense now. Not only that, but I've gone over this Greek symbol too. And my 666 mark of the beast, and Yahuwah willing, I'm going to be going over that more next week as well. So the question is, why is this the case? Again, why are they holding up this satanic hand gesture right here in all of these pictures that depict the Messiah, even ancient ones, as well as this Greek symbol right here? Because remember, there should be no graven images, period. But what did the enemies do? They what? They painted their, their Greek symbols and what? The halos on them as well to denote sun worship. But more importantly, why is this hand gesture seen all over the place. But you also see it in modern depictions of Mary as well. You see the exact same hand gesture right here. Not only that, but you also see what the sun halo symbol around her as well, just as you do with pictures and images, abominable ones, by the way, of JC. And we know that the mother of the real Messiah looked nothing like this, that they were all dark-skinned black people back then, whether you want to believe that or not. And that's according to scripture itself. But why are they all always holding up this symbol right here. That is the question we should be thinking about. And I'm even showing you a picture of Buddha as well. And you can see that what Buddha and the sun symbol around his head, the halo around his head in this religious depiction. And you can also see what another hand gesture, except in this one, there are three fingers held up instead of two, but it's the exact same hand gesture. Why is that the case? It's the exact same image, the exact same thing. Why do we see that over and over again? And not only JC and Mary, but also so Buddha too? And that should be what we are thinking about because here we are at an ancient statue of Buddha again. And as you can see what the same hand gesture all over again. I wonder why that is. I wonder what that's really depicting and showing you. But we also see the same thing embedded in the Hindu religion as well because here I am at a picture of Shiva, the Hindu god of destruction. And you can see the hand gesture right here. And instead of two fingers up, he has all his fingers up and what the sun symbol the halo behind him and what serpents around his neck hello this should be ringing some alarm bells but like i said ask yourself why that is the question all religion aside all conspiracies aside why is it that all of these religious figures are depicted with these hand gestures and hand symbols is the question
But yet we see the same thing in Hindu religion when we look at Brahma as well. We see the sun symbol back here. We see more hand gestures right there. What is it that they're trying to show us? What is it that they're really trying to really show us? And like I said, why is it that we're seeing the same symbolisms and even some of the same uh, similar hand gestures that are seen in pictures of JC, Mary, Buddha, and even Shiva? Why is that the case? Here is a common depiction of Zoroaster or the Iranian sun god and as you can see what you see the sun right behind him and you also see instead of two fingers he's holding up one finger. What is going on? Why is it that you're always seeing these depictions in these different religions worldwide and in world religions? What is it that they're really trying to show us here? But we also see the same depictions for Krishna as well. We see the same halo depicted around and we also see what the hand gestures as well. Only this time he has two fingers, the middle two fingers pointed down and the other two pointed upward. It's the same darn hand gesture. Just what are they trying to show us? What is it really alluding to? Have you ever asked yourself these questions before? Now you may be wondering, well, what does this have to do with the image of the beast? And how does this all relate with the Catholic Church? And what how does this all relate to the Vatican and how does this relate to any of that because what you're about to see is that what the biggest deception of all time is about to take place in the merging of all these religions together the one world religion isn't that what the Vatican's pushing to blend all these religions and to come together with under all these religions isn't that what they're pushing but is it a coincidence that all of these religious figures all of which are abominable by the way including the one you're looking at is it is it a coincidence coincidence that they all hold up some type of hand gesture and that they all have some type of halo depicted around them no matter where you search it no matter where you go you see the same thing why is that the case and like I said when you look at this hand gesture right here I'm about to show you something that's about to blow your mind literally because what you're gonna see is that JC is not the only one or not the only image that holds up this hand gesture there is another figure that holds up this exact same hand gesture and you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. Is it a coincidence? I think not because what you're looking at is the exact same hand symbol and hand gesture of the Baphomet and the Baphomet statue that was placed in Detroit. Is that a coincidence? You see the exact same hand gesture right here. The same hand gesture that the, that the false messiah known as JC and even Mary that they hold up in all of those religious symbols and icons. Do you think that is a coincidence? Do you think that this is a coincidence? It's not looking like it especially when I've just proven to you with scripture itself that what? That the Messiah looks nothing like that JC. He's not white and he doesn't have that long hair because he has woolly hair. So where is this coming from and why do you see this exact same hand gesture that JC holds up as well? Is that a coincidence? You all need to seriously wake up. Satan's literally putting it in front of you, literally putting it in front of your face that who JC, that who that image really is. It's the image image of the beast because the Messiah don't look like that according to scripture. I hope you're seeing that and by the way his name is not Jesus either because what the Messiah has a Hebrew name because he's Hebrew and the letter J did not exist 500 years ago. Please go do your research on this. Do you think this is a coincidence? I think not. I told you it was going to blow your mind because I'm trying to get you to see the real bigger agenda with all of this because what the two fingers up and the two fingers pointing down that is a freemasonic satanic hand gesture and the sun a halo behind him denotes and represents sun worship the image of the beast but as i've just shown you and proven to you today it's not just him it's also mary krishna buddha brahma shiva and even zoroaster it's all of them and the image of the beast is it goes from what all of those religions included it's not just it's not just christianity it's all of them included including Christianity by the way it has a cross right here the real Messiah did not die on a cross he was hung on a tree you can read about that in Acts chapter 5 verses 30 Acts chapter 10 verses 39 Acts chapter 13 verses 29 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 24 and even Galatians chapter 3 verses 13 to 14 so you will not be deceived by what's to come and I'm going to tell you the bigger deceptions to come because do you think it's a coincidence that you see 
see this exact same hand gesture on the Baphomet goat. And what? The Baphomet goat just so happens to resemble what? A sheep or a lamb with horns? Like the second beast of Revelation, the dragon? Oh, now it's making sense. Why did I just show you all of that? Why am I showing you all of these things so you can see the truth and so that you will not be deceived for the bigger deception that is to come? Not only that, but also what? So you can see the what, what the Vatican is actually doing and what the Pope is stressing and what the Pope is doing in the bigger agenda behind all this. Because here I am at Catholic News Agency and it says in first prayer video, Pope stresses interfaith unity. We are all children of God. Well, which God is he talking about but let's keep going it says it says here that the pope's first ever video message on his monthly prayer intentions was released tuesday highlighting the importance of interreligious dialogue and the beliefs uh, different faith traditions hold in common such as the figure of so-called god even though that's not the name of our creator and love and it says many think differently feel differently seeking god or meeting god in different ways according to this and this crowd in the range of religions there is only one certainty that we have for all, we are all children of God, G-O-D, Pope Francis said in his message released January 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany. By the way, that feast is abominable too because you're not to add or take away from Scripture. Well, when you add to the seven feast days, that is abominable. Not only that, but this whole thing is abominable because what is the Pope trying to push? He's trying to say that, oh, all faiths are okay. Oh, you can find G-O-D in your own way. Oh, you can find them however way you want, whatever religion you want. We're all on the same path trying to find him that is abominable when scripture tells us how to find the real true creator or the the creator of heaven and earth how we can all find him by seeking his scripture and following his torah and his law statutes and commandments that is according to scripture and even according to the messiah himself in matthew chapter 5 verses 17 through 20 and john chapter 14 verses 15 so no the law was not done away with but why am i showing you this and sharing you that with this because the pope is pushing this one world religion agenda in order to unite all faiths and unite all religions because not only do they have to push the one world government and the one world currency they also have to push the one world religion for the new world order and the only way they can do that is by pushing all this through the pope and the vatican who is the deadly wound that was healed which is what that all the world wondered after the beast via religion now, I'm not going to go over all of this in its entirety, but it says why all faiths can unite to end modern slavery, because that is what they're trying to do. Problem, reaction, solution. And what is the Pope and the papacy? What are they trying to do? Unite all faiths to end modern slavery. What does that sound like? One world religion. New world religion is what they are doing. And they're, and they're trying to merge all of these religions together by, by uh, blaspheming and saying that, oh, it's okay. You can seek G-O-D in your own way you can seek him this way you can seek him that way you can use that faith to seek him you can use this faith to seek him you can use Sikhism to seek him but we know better than that and we know that goes against scripture and we know that the Pope is speaking pure blasphemies against the Most High we know that for a fact now, the most notable time that we saw the Pope push this one world religion onto us was when he visited the United States for the very first time back in September 2015 and when he held the multi-religious service at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum and the World Train Center at Ground Zero on September 25th, 2015. And during this time, as we saw from the actual event and what we saw what took place in New York City is that all these people from all the different religions and walks of faith they all came up to the podium and they all were right there with the pope and what was the pope trying to do push the agenda that oh we can all come together all merge together under what a new world religion and that is what we can do if we want to get closer to god well my question is which god do you think they are talking about. You can actually read it here if you want to. I will definitely leave the link below, but as you can see, this is what they're preparing for. This is what they're getting us ready for. They're getting 
us ready and mentally conditioning us and trying to push this one world religion agenda as well as the one world government and the one world currency as we continue to see but also they're pushing this one world religion agenda and this is what how many popes later how many years later how many hundreds of years later the deadly wound has been healed and the world has wandered after the beast and like I said, I use those images for educational purposes so that you can see the bigger agenda, so that you can see what's going on and wake up to truth. And what is the bigger deception? Project Blue Beam, which is about to take place because the Vatican and the Jesuits, they have a lot to do with this because what's about to happen? Your president's about to go onto the screen and the Vatican's about to go onto the screen and they're about to tell you that, oh my goodness, we made contact with aliens. There are aliens out there. They're getting ready for the false aside because when when all of this chaos and destruction starts to happen the only way they can merge as a new world order under one world religion is through the false messiah and you're about oh you're going to see a jesus christ all right in the sky and if you're not awakened to this now you're gonna think it's the real one when it is in fact the hologram do not bow down to the hologram be not deceived anymore look at the hand gesture do not be deceived when when this takes place and it's not just going to be the JC you see it's going to be the Buddha depicted in Asian countries and the Krishna depicted in Indian nations and it's going to be Muhammad depicted in Islamic countries do not be fooled when this happens because it's only a matter of time when they do this if you have not watched my project blue beam video please do so you will not be deceived I'm doing this video so that you will not be deceived so you will see the truth for what it really is and so that you will see what's about to take place and what's about to happen because these bigger deceptions will happen and if you're not ready for them well then you will be taking a loop read second thessalonians chapter 2 what our creator our father sends you a strong delusion so that you can believe a lie and that strong delusion is religion itself christianity included being perpetrated by the beast system known as the roman catholic church also read wisdom of solomon chapter 14 a book they took out of scripture and we'll actually go there in a minute but please do not be deceived when these deceptions take place because it's only a matter of time because remember the deceptions are coming to a sky near you when you see about and hear about these so-called aliens and ufos that they've been mentally conditioning your mind for for the past 100 years or so do not be fooled it is what it is the fallen angels the demons and the demigods literally but i'm here in second thessalonians chapter 2 and it talks about the strong delusion and we're going to be reading from verses 7 through 12 and it says for the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom Yahuwah shall consume with the ruach of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in him that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, which is the Torah, which is the law, statutes, and commandments of Yahuwah, and his true son the true passover lamb yahusha that they might be saved and for this cause because they believe the lie yahuwah Allahim shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they might all be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness and that includes religion itself yes christianity included and the question is are you under this strong delusion like I said, I've just proven with scripture itself that the false Messiah is that white image seen all over the place and that the Messiah does not look like that according to Revelation chapter 1 verses 13 to 15, the real Messiah. Now we're here and with the wisdom of Solomon chapter 14 and we're going to be reading from verses 21. I recommend you read verses 8 through 21. I'll leave the link below. And this was an occasion to deceive the world for men suing either calumet or tyranny did ascribe unto stones and stalkers and 
in, the incommunicable name that's talking about what the bigger deceptions of the beast to come. Please seek Yahuwah and his true son, Yahusha, so you can wake up to truth and not be fooled by the deceptions coming to a sky near you. This is Truth Unveiled here saying, be well, take care, shalom. To be exact, that is talking about the deadly wound. And I'm going to show you an article later on to even prove that. But let's keep going. We're going to verse 11. And now we're going to the second beast that comes up. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast or papal Rome or the Roman Catholic Church whose deadly wound was healed. And we know the deadly wound is the Vatican, which I'm about to show you in just a second. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven or Shamaim on the Arats or earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles that which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all both great and small, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, if you saw my uh, 666 video and is 666 the mark of the beast, you would have seen that scripture and that this was originally written in Greek. So it would be a Greek symbol in verse 18. And I proved that 666 is not the mark of the beast, but rather the mark of the beast has to do with worship. It has to do with religion itself. And you can watch my video on that for more. And Yahuwah willing, next week I'm going to be doing part two to the mark of the beast so you can see exactly what it really truly is. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is not 666. It is a Greek symbol. And when it says number, that is mistranslating. It should say symbol or mark is what that should say. So we know that the beast and the image of the beast has to do something with the Roman Catholic Church. We know it has to do with the Vatican, and we know it has to do with Papal Rome. And as I proved in my uh, Mark of the Beast video in the part one, I even told you and showed you of hidden history in the Inquisition that took place between the years 538 AD and 1798 AD, and how the Roman Catholic Church is responsible for the deaths of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people during this times with their heresies and all of their other heretical nonsense that they put in and enforce in order for the world to worship the beast. And if people did not worship or if they did not follow the beast, then they were seen as what? They were seen as peasants and heresies and they had to be killed. And just look at the Puritans for more and the whole Salem witch trials and that will tell you exactly what I'm talking about, and you're going to see that, and you're even going to see that they even played a role with slavery too, so that should be a big hint, but let's keep going. As I have said before, and as I have said earlier, the deadly wound that was healed was in fact the establishment of the Vatican, or should I say the re-establishment of the Vatican, known as Vatican City, which was on February 11th, 1929. So that prophecy has already been fulfilled. Now, mainstream Christian churches want you to believe that, oh, it has to do with the future prophecy, and oh, it has to do with some antichrist coming onto the scene in the middle of a three and a half year period and Daniel's 70th week. No, that is all pure blasphemy when all of these prophecies have been fulfilled. And so we're going to see exactly how, if okay, if we know that the beast has to do with papal Rome and we know that the beast has to do with Rome itself and the Catholic Church, or should I say the Roman Catholic Church, because all roads lead to Rome, then we know that the image of the beast has something to do with what the Catholic Church and what the Roman Catholic Church is pushing. It has to, according to scripture. It cannot do with anything else. It has to do with something that's tied with the Roman Catholic Church. And you're going to even see just what I'm talking about.
Now I'm here at the Britannica Encyclopedia, and like I said, the image of the beast has to do something with a pope or has to do with the Roman Catholic Church, since we have just identified that the Roman Catholic Church is the first beast that is identified. What is the image of the beast? That is the question we will be tackling today. And with this video, I hope you see the real truth behind what has been hidden from you, as well as hidden history from you, so that you can see the truth and be deceived no more, because I'm letting you know there is a bigger deception coming. But we've all heard of the phrase image of the beast and mark of the beast, but what is the real image of the beast that scripture is talking about, and how can we identify the image of the beast using scripture itself to help us. That and more to come as we tackle this question and go along this journey into finding truth because the truth will be revealed today. In order for us to properly identify the image of the beast, we must first seek scripture and see what scripture says about the image of the beast and let scripture speak for itself. And so here I am in Hazun or Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to be going over this chapter with you in detail and I'm going to show you then what the real image of the beast really is and just who the beasts really are. So we're here in Revelation chapter 13 and it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns okay and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy and the beast which i saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority and i saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast and i'm going to go over with you in just a second what that deadly wound actually is and they worshiped the beast which gave power unto or they worshiped the dragon i should say which gave power unto the beast and they worshiped the beast saying who is like unto this beast who is able to make more war with him and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months and because this is a truth network, I use the set apart restored Hebrew names for our creator Yahuwah and his true son Yahusha. So it says in verses six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against what you may call in the Hebrew Elohim. Another way to pronounce that is Allahim to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in Shamayim or heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the Kadashim or saints and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world that's talking about the real messiah yahusha if any man have an ear let him hear he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity he that killeth with the sword shall be killed by the sword here is the patience and the belief of the kadashim and i beheld another beast coming out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon so let's first go over the first 10 verses and what you start to see is who is this first beast well first of all we can all agree that the first beast is talking about what papal rome and the roman catholic church all roads lead to rome and we can agree and we know that scripture is talking about that is because when it says that he speaks great things and blasphemies, that this beast will speak great blasphemies, when it says 42 months, we have to take the day and a year prophecy that is spoken of in the book of Bamidbar or Numbers. And when you do this, you get 1,260 years is what that means. So it's not a literal 42 months or three and a half years as the Christian church falsely teaches. No, it is actually 1,260 years that that's talking about and what one entity just so happens to fit that prophecy quite well is the roman catholic church is because the roman catholic church came into power in 538 a.d really into power 
and it ended in 1798 AD with the with the exile of one of the popes by Napoleon himself. And when it says that the deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast, what is the deadly wound talking about? The deadly wound is talking about the establishment of the Vatican in 1929 on February 11th, 1929 and Revelation chapter 13. And later on, I'm going to tell you what the second beast is. But here I am at the Britannica website and it talks about Pope Alexander the Sixth. And you're going to see why he's so important and what this has to do with the image of the beast and the purporting of the image of the beast. Now it says Alexander the Sixth, or the original Spanish name in full, Rodrigo de Borgia de Domes, Italian Rodrigo Borgia, born 1431 uh, near Valencia and died on August 18, 1503 in Rome, a corrupt, worldly, and ambitious pope whose neglect of the spiritual inheritance of the church contributed to the development of Protestant Reformation. He was born into the Spanish branch of the prominent and powerful Borgia family. So, okay, so we see that. We see his family and his background. You can read more about his family here. I'll leave the link below. But what I also want to talk about here is during the shadow of simony that surrounded the disposal of his benefices among the papal electors, Rodrigo emerged from a tumultuous conclave on the night of August 10th through the 11th, 1492, as Pope Alexander VI and received the acclaim of the Roman populace. He embarked upon a reform of papal finances in a vigorous pursuit of the war against the Ottoman Turks. Remember that the beast would make war against the real true Kadashim and that they would make war and cause the, uh, any of them who did not worship or bow down to the Pope's orders to be killed, which is what happened through the Inquisition, especially during this time. But let's keep going. His position was menaced by the French King Charles VIII, who invaded Italy in 1494 to vindicate his claim to the Kingdom of Naples. Charles, at the instant Investigation of a rival cardinal on the influential Della Revere family threatened the Pope with de deposition and the convocation of a reform council. Politically isolated, Alexander sought assistance from the Turkish sovereign Bayezid II. In the course of the Pope's meeting with King Charles in Rome in early 1495, however, he received the traditional obeisance from the French monarch. He still refused to support the king's claim to Naples and, by an alliance with Milan, Venice, and the Holy Roman Emperor, eventually forced the French to withdraw from Italy. But why is he so important? Is because